In the 1950s, a white record producer named Sam Phillips was working on rock and roll music from black musicians across Memphis. He realized that if he could get a white person to sing this style of music, he'd be a billionaire. He tested this theory with a singer named Elvis Presley, who was an instant success. Soon, more and more white musicians were promoted, and the black musicians who pioneered the music were left behind. It was one of music's greatest ever injustices. Sam Phillips lived during a period of segregation where white people and black people were expected to live separately. However, he got to know black people and their music through working on farms in his hometown of Florence, Alabama. In an interview, he said, As a child, there was a real awakening of my spirit because I had spent so much time around black people. I saw the unbelievable talents that these people had. In Florence, white and black people picked cotton together, plowed together, did everything except, quote unquote, socialize. And this amazing music of blues, gospel, soul, and jazz was not being heard by the average American. Sam then moved to Memphis, which was, at that time, the epicenter of black music, and venues alongside Beale Street, the likes of jazz legend Louis Armstrong and blues pioneer B.B. King would regularly perform. However, because of the way things were, there was a lack of recording studios available to black musicians, and Phillips tried to correct this by setting up his own recording studio. Here, anyone of any race could record a song at a very affordable price. In 1949, Phillips signed a lease to an old automobile glass repair shop, and a year later, he opened Memphis Recording Service. Phillips said, I just thought that black music should be exposed in the right form, and somebody that pervaded should not be ashamed of it. However, because of segregation, Sam was heavily criticized for mixing with black artists. His response was not to push back or anything, but to simply just get on with things. In an interview, he said, You almost have to transpose yourself back to those days and to what people had to confront. I knew the way whites felt about blacks. I didn't feel that way. Yeah, I didn't condemn the other people because I knew that to a degree they had no control over generation after generation of prejudice. These things I had to deal with, the social situations. I'm not a shrinking violet, but I never would have made it had I gone out and tried to challenge. Sam's recording studio was used by local blues artists such as Howlin' Wolf, B.B. King, and James Cotton. In 1951, he produced the song Rocket 88 by Ike Turner, which is often credited as the very first rock and roll song. This was a louder and more aggressive variation of rhythm and blues music with an emphasis on the guitar. Sam then set up his own label, Sun Records, in 1952. These artists were making great music, but not enough money. Around this period, Phillips uttered the prophetic line, if I could find a white man who had the Negro sound and the Negro feel, I can make a billion dollars. And eventually, a 19-year-old truck driver called Elvis Presley walked into the studio hoping to record some songs as a gift for his mother. Phillips was impressed by his singing voice, his looks, and his charisma. His wish had come true when Elvis was signed to Sun Records. His debut single, That's Alright, was released in July 1954 and quickly became a hit and there was a rather interesting distinction in how America responded to Elvis Presley over his black counterparts. Elvis's classic song, Hound Dog, was originally performed by the black artist Big Mama Thorne in 1953. Thorne's version was successful and peaked at number one on the Rhythm and Blues chart, but did not cross over into the mainstream. Elvis's version, meanwhile, reached the top of the pop charts for 11 weeks running. Big Mama Thorne was left embittered by this, recalling how she, quote, got one check for $500 and never saw another, and called it, the record I made Elvis Presley rich on. Little Richard was a big rock and roll star, but his record label was eager to have his song sung by white artists. In 1955, he released the song Tutti Frutti, but two years later, his label offered the song up to a white singer called Pat Boone. Boone said it didn't make sense for him to cover a recent Little Richard song, but the producers talked him into it. Despite being the same song, Boone's version made number 12 on the national pop chart, with Little Richard's trailing behind only reaching number 21. Little Richard claims that he was sidelined as a rhythm and blues artist, rather than the pop and rock artist that Elvis was being platformed as. In an interview, Little Richard said, They didn't want me to be in the white guy's way. I felt I was pushed into a rhythm and blues corner to keep out a rocker's way, because that's where the money is. When Tutti Frutti came out, they needed a rock star to block me out of white homes because I was a hero to white kids. And essentially, the higher-ups did not want Little Richard to become a sex symbol like Elvis. Little Richard went on to say, The white kids would have Pat Boone upon the dresser and me in the drawer because they like my version better. 
but the families didn't want me because of the image that I was projecting. Another common theme was that songs were covered, but tweaked to be more palatable to a mass audience. The song Louie Louie by Richard Berry was a B-side in 1957, but in 1963, a cover by the white band The Kingsmen reached number two on the Billboard 100. Richard Berry's version had lyrics sung in Jamaican patois and contained calypso elements. The Kingsmen's version stripped the song of these characteristics and became a huge hit. A similar thing happened much later when Eric Clapton covered Bob Marley's song I Shot the Sheriff. The track was slightly diluted of its reggae sound and performed much better on the charts. One of the few black artists that broke into the mainstream was Fats Domino who had hits with Ain't That Shame, Blueberry Hill, and Blue Monday. He sold 65 million records and was the highest selling musician after Elvis. In fact, Elvis even tried to use his platform to promote Domino too. After performing in Las Vegas, an interviewer referred to him as the king of rock and roll, but Elvis pointed towards Domino and said, there's the real king of rock and roll. But arguably, Elvis' biggest rival of all was Chuck Berry. In 1956, Berry's management decided to make him look whiter in his publicity photos in the hopes of getting him more gigs. This stunt backfired when he turned up to the concert and clearly, this man was not what he looked like. Chuck Berry was scheduled to perform a gig in Knoxville, but when he arrived, he was informed that this was a whites-only club and they did not realize he was black. So, despite having sold out for this concert, he was not allowed to play. Bruce Pegg, who wrote a biography on Chuck Berry, said, Elvis Presley may have become successful, like other white performers, before and since, by imitating black performers, but never once would he have felt it necessary to change his appearance and pass for black. For Chuck Berry, however, such racial ambiguity was necessary if he, like Presley, was to cultivate a white audience. And after the success of Elvis, Sam Phillips would turn from hero to villain in the eyes of many black musicians. He started mainly promoting white musicians such as Johnny Cash, Roy Orbison, and Jerry Lee Lewis. This had led many to the conclusion that Phillips had abandoned black artists. Phillips' rather unsatisfactory response to this criticism was, When I started recording whites, I was accused of abandoning black people after getting out of them what I wanted, that I was using black people. In actuality, it was totally to the contrary. I would love to have kept recording black people, period. And I continued to record some, but not as many. My thinking was that if we could record white people that felt the emotions that were so akin to black people's emotions, this could broaden the base for the acceptance of that type of feel in music. I felt that this would not be achieved in any other way, maybe never, or certainly not as soon as it was. By the 1960s, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones were dominating the charts, and a lot of their early music contained covers from black artists. These artists were their heroes, and they were somewhat aware of how much bigger they had become than them. In 1965, the Rolling Stones refused to play on the American show Shindig unless they could be supported by Howlin' Wolf. Muddy Waters, whose song Rolling Stone is where the band got its name, was in a weird situation where he was retrospectively becoming popular because of his connection to the Stones. He famously said, They stole my music, but they gave me my name. When Chuck Berry was being inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Keith Richards gave a speech where he said, It's very difficult for me to talk about Chuck Berry because I lifted every lick he ever played. This is the gentleman who started it all, as far as I'm concerned. And while these are nice words, the disparity of wealth between the two is something to behold. When Chuck Berry passed away in 2017, his estate was worth 50 million. Not something to scoff at. But whereas today, Keith Richards has an estimated wealth of 10 times that at 500 million. During the 60s, the popularity of Fats Domino was in decline. But in 1968, the Beatles had a hit with Lady Madonna, which was Paul McCartney doing a Fats Domino impression. McCartney said, Lady Madonna was me, sitting down at the piano, trying to write a bluesy, boogie-woogie thing. It reminded me of Fats Domino for some reason, so I started singing a Fats Domino impression. It took my other voice to a very odd place. Ultimately, rock and roll in the 60s was predominantly performed by white musicians, but with one notable exception, Jimi Hendrix. And by this stage in the mid-60s, rock music had gone full circle, where Jimi was accused of ripping off white artists. Music journalist Anthony DeCurtis spoke about this issue and said, While bands like the Rolling Stones ransacked black musical styles and reaped adulatory reviews, Hendrix was accused of ripping off white artists like The Who, who, of course, characterized their own music as maximum R&B, derived from black American musicians, many of whom Hendrix had played behind as he was getting his start. 
In the coming decades, rock music was perceived as a white genre of music. It got to the stage where a record label naively wanted the rock singer Lenny Kravitz to make music that was more in line with his background. Kravitz said, I was playing music that was rooted in rock and roll, which at the time they thought was white music. Of course, we know that black people invented rock and roll. They thought I should be doing hip hop or an R&B. And they thought I was talented, but they did not want me to be making that music. They didn't know how to deal with that. So I was offered several deals and I could have taken them, but they would have wanted me to change, have somebody produce me. And I refused. As hip hop began to grow, there were reasonable concerns that history might repeat itself, especially when Eminem saw unprecedented success in the early 2000s and became hip hop's Elvis. But Eminem's success was not followed up by other white artists. And instead, the likes of 50 Cent, Lil Wayne, and Kanye West would come to the forefront. Hip hop, for now at least, and likely for the rest of time, is still firmly attached to its roots. But as for the likes of Chuck Berry, Little Richard, Fats Domino, and others, their legacy is still heavily overlooked. So, if you are a fan of rock music and have never heard of any of these artists, it might help to give them a listen and see where the music you love came from. Make sure to subscribe for more.